and we are making really detailed measurements of the radiation coming in from the sky and the radiation being reflected by the snow in order to calculate that snow albedo continuously, essentially. And here's, here are the results of, of a single spot measurement of snow albedo using uh, the same sorts of instrumentation. And it's actually a measurement of this dirty snow compared to this snow that where the dusty surface was scraped away. And this plot is a little bit overkill, a little bit of overkill, but if you think of visible light as in this box here, in these wavelengths, and think of this scale as zero to one or zero to 100%, it's, it's fairly straightforward. Again, you know, clean snow, and this being comparatively clean is going to reflect anywhere from 100% at these wavelengths way down here to something around 80% at the end of the visible spectrum. So average maybe 90 across that. Whereas this dirty snow, and this is desert dust on the snow surface, is reflecting somewhere between 50 and 60 percent. And the, the other way to think about it is that clean snow is absorbing 10 percent of the radiation. Dirty snow is absorbing 50, 40 to 50 percent of the radiation. So that's a gigantic effect on the energy budget at the snowpack surface. And quintupling the amount of solar energy available for snowmelt is no small thing. And uh, we'll show you some evidence of how dramatic that effect can be. This is another way to look at the contribution of reduced albedo from dust on total energy budget at the snowpack surface. So this is a graph of five different days in May of uh, I think this was 05, and uh, these are the air temperatures on those, get, on those days. Now, the conventional wisdom about snowmelt is that it's air temperature driven. And, you know, rut routinely you will hear people talk about it's going to warm up, we're going to see stream flow, stream flows go up this spring uh, during this warm weather coming up. That, that is true, that warm air does affect snowmelt. But this graph shows the proportionate contributions of warm air, which is May 2005, warm air, which is the contribution represented by this blue line. And so here's the scale of energy being introduced into the snow surface in units of watts per meter squared, kind of instantaneous energy. And we'll look first at the sensible heat, which is air, the turbulent mixing of air with the snow surface. And there's the graph in blue. And so you see that, you know, at, at sort of at maximums, midday, the the values are around 200 watts per square meter. And go down in the evening, there is some persistent energy being produced during the night if the air temps stay up above freezing. Uh, that's going to contribute a little bit to snow melt. Then we'll look at the net solar. And this is the net amount of solar energy being absorbed after some is bit, some, some's reflected, but some is absorbed at the snow surface. And, and you can see that these are peaking at upwards of 500 watts. And so relative to the air, even though, you know, the sun goes down <laughs> at night and there is no net solar uh, contribution, the, the 
amount of energy being produced or pushed into the snowpack by this directly absorbed solar energy, directly absorbed in the dust material itself at the snow surface is really, really significant and really becomes the dominant driver of snowmelt uh, when the snowpack albedo goes down uh, from that sort of pristine, clean snow. Uh, so the net of all this, these other elements in snowmelt are net long wave, the, the sort of uh, re-emitted energy after it's absorbed from uh, short wave energy being absorbed by objects uh, like trees, uh, rocks and things, almost negative. It is negative all the time. This is one of the characteristics of Colorado snowpack and particularly the San Juan Mountains where the, the snowpack is typically emitting more energy than it's absorbing. Dust changes that, but in a clean snowpack, the net amount of energy uh, from radiative processes is actually negative. Even during a very warm day, uh, where air temperatures are well above freezing, the snow surface will stay dry and cold because of emitted long wave radiation on a clear day. Then the other term is latent heat, uh, the amount of energy that's, that's absorbed or generated or, or captured during the phase change of water from vapor to, to solid to liquid, etc. That's also almost always negative. So the real players in snowmelt are air temperatures and the effects of reducing the snow albedo. And, and here's what we're really talking about. And this is last spring, the, the snow surface at our, uh, one of our two primary study sites near Red Mountain Pass, almost, you know, looks like the ground. Uh, this is snow that was dug out of the snow pit. These are, there's a couple women in this snow pit digging, doing some sampling and things. And you can just, this is just self-evident that, you know, when snow is this dirty, it's just gonna absorb a lot of energy, solar energy. and for, for the sake of comparison, we sample this, this snow in the series of 10 like bread slices of known volume and known area, uh, known volume, and, and actually melt and weigh the amount of material in those samples over the course of the whole spring. And in spring of 2008, the largest concentration of <coughs> dust that we saw on the snow surface was 12 grams per square meter. Last spring it was 55 grams. So last year was really kind of off the chart, not only in our own experience in the very short history of our research effort, but it also in the, in the, in the experience of long time observers, uh, people who had spent lifetimes and actually several generations of lifetimes watching mountain snowpacks and paying close attention to how snowmelt was occurring in the spring. Ranchers, water managers, other kinds of resource people. And they had not seen anything like this, this uh, display of dust last year. So you know, we, we sort of really do believe that fif this, this was something of a rare and maybe extreme case. Uh, whereas this was our typical kind of uh, observation over the course of our research, which is very short period of time. 